Hi, I'm Matthias Beck. I'm one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. And in this video, we'll continue our discussions of Dedekind sums, Fourier Dedekind sums, and we'll prove some first theorems coming out of their appearance in the restricted partition functions. Let me remind you from the last video how Fourier Dedekind sums appear. So we looked at the restricted partition function p sub a of n. a is a set of positive integers a1 through ad. And then through generating function setup, the constant term computation, we came up with this formula for the restricted partition function. The capital B1, B2, and so on are coefficients of a partial fraction decomposition. So they came from this setup. They are the coefficients belonging to the poles equals 1 of our generating function from the previous video. And then we have these Fourier Dedekind sums. Here I am reminding you of their definition. These are finite Fourier series in n. And for the restricted partition function with d parameters, we will have d of them appearing here. Let me make two remarks about this first part of our formula. So this alternating sum of these partial fractions decompositions coming from the poles equals 1. So I claim, and I'm inviting you to prove that, that this first part will always be a polynomial in n. And so we'll abbreviate this as poly sub a of n. It depends on the parameters a1 through ad. And there's actually a connection of this polynomial with Bernoulli polynomials that we've seen in chapter 2. So I claim this, this polynomial function is a generalized Bernoulli polynomial. If you look at the generating function that you see here on the right, this is called an exponential generating function because we have a k factorial here. If I only have one parameter, a1, and if that parameter is 1, I'm essentially giving you a generating function of the Bernoulli polynomials. And so in this sense, these are generalizations of Bernoulli polynomials. They're called Bernoulli-Barnes polynomials. And you can get this formula actually from our partial fraction decomposition by a change of variables. So this is a little bit of analysis. And if you're interested in this, in the last chapter of the book where we do some complex analysis, we give you a detailed hint why this is true. At any rate, so you can sort of see these factors here as really similar compared to our the generating function that gave rise to the restricted partition function except that we have an exponential variable here. Instead of a z to the a1, we now have an e to the a1 times z. And this amounts to switching from a pole at z equals 1 to 1 at z equals 0. And I claim this change of variable is precisely what gives rise to the generating function that you can see here. At any rate, the really the only thing we need is that this um, initial segment of our formula is a polynomial in n, and so we'll use this abbreviation from now on. Okay, we're now ready to prove some theorems about these Fourier Dedekind sums. We will do so by using some of the theory that we've learned so far on restricted partition functions, on Erhard Quasar polynomials, and so on. So what I'll need now is that this restricted partition function is an Erhard Quasar polynomial. This has a simple consequence, so we know that the constant term, and so by this, again, I don't mean I'm counting something, but I'm, I'm using the geometry behind Erhard Quasar polynomials and how we set them up very carefully, this constant term is 1. And so, of course, 
I can do that now in my formula for the restricted partition function. So if I plug in n equals 0, that gets me a left-hand side of 1. I can plug in n equals 0 into the sort of polynomial part. That gives me some rational expression. And then if I plug in n equals 0 into um, these Fourier Dedekin sums, we will get sort of a trivial numerator up here. Still, these are special cases of the Fourier Dedekin sums. And so we have a relation now from the fact that the restricted partition function has constant term 1. And this is this theorem here. Yeah, so if we now forget about that there was this complicated restricted partition function over here, and just use the fact that its constant term as a quasi-polynomial is 1, we can now look at this, if you want, from the right-hand side and get a relation for Fourier Dedekind sums where this parameter n is 0. We call this um, Zagier reciprocity because this is a reformulation of a famous theorem by Don Zagier about generalized Dedekind sums. I should mention that these kinds of reciprocity theorems is different from Erhard MacDonald reciprocity. So what we're doing here is we have a set of parameters and reciprocity in this case says that we take this set of parameters and cyclically permute them in our expression. So in this case, a Fourier Dedekind sum so individually, each of these sums are complicated animals, but somehow if I sum them up in the cyclic fashion, I get sort of a closed form. This is simply a rational expression in the parameters a1 through ad. The prettiest form of this reciprocity theorem we get for the classical Dedekind sum. So here on the right, I'm reminding you of its definition. And in the last video, we proved that this is essentially a Fourier Dedekind sum with n equals 0 of the form a1b. And so, what I mean by essentially is I mean up to some trivial factors and some ands. And so, what this suggests is we should apply this theorem now for the special case where you know a1 is a, a2 is some parameter b, and then a3 is equal to 1. Yeah, so this suggests um, you know, we're going to use the case d equals 3. And I'm sure you realize if a3 is 1, it plays the role of this last parameter over here the Fourier Dedekind sum will be trivial because we're not summing over any roots of unity over here. And what pops out of this special case is this reciprocity theorem for the classical Dedekind sum. Yeah, so now we're just cyclically permuting two parameters. It just amounts to switching the two parameters. And again, individually, these are complicated sums. Just think of A and B as let's say, two really large numbers. Nevertheless, if you're summing them, you get this easy, rational expression on the right-hand side. Let me spend a few minutes talking about the Dedekind reciprocity law. So this is a famous theorem coming out of analytic number theory. The Dedekind sum originally appeared in what's now called the Dedekind eta function. And so if you look at the transformation properties of the Dedekind eta function, you need to understand the Dedekind sum. This is one of the ingredients. One, and one way to view this reciprocity law, one way to prove it also, comes from this transformation property Dedekind eta function. Let me also remark that this is equivalent, so in a 
mathematical sense of like equivalence of theorems to a quadratic reciprocity. So this is a even more famous theorem of Gauss. And if you've taken a class in number theory, you've seen this theorem. And it's a, a non-trivial exercise, but it's a fun exercise to prove that the Gauss reciprocity theorem for the Legendre symbol is equivalent to this reciprocity theorem of Dedekind that you see on the page here. But there is another consequence, and maybe this is more important, and that has to do with computational complexity. If you think of the definition of a Dedekind sum, then you realize we can replace a by reducing it modulo b. So this simply comes from the fact that a appears here in the numerator of one of those sawtooth functions. Sawtooth function has b as the denominator, and so we can always reduce a modulo b. And so now what that means is I can apply the dedicated reciprocity law repeatedly and at each step reduce one of the variables modulo the other one. So what I mean by this is, you know, somebody hands you two large integers and says, I'm interested in a dedicated sum with these two parameters. Then what we can do is we can compute the right-hand side. So let me call this something. I'm, I'm thinking of this right-hand side as sort of an easy rational expression, A and B. I can compute this right-hand side and then subtract S of B comma A. And so now I can reduce this. And of course, maybe I should have said this in the beginning. I might as well think of A here as already reduced modulo B. And so one application of the reciprocity law means I can switch A and B and then reduce B modulo A. And now repeat. If this smells like the Euclidean algorithm to you, then you have exactly the right intuition. If you think of the Euclidean algorithm that you can use, for example, to compute the GCD of two integers, then exactly something like this happens. You're using the division algorithm on two integers, compute a remainder, and then make this reduction step because the remainder is, is exactly this reduction that I'm pointing to here when I say, let's take B and reduce it modulo A. In the Euclidean algorithm, you repeat, and the magic is by repeatedly reducing modulo an integer, you have an amazingly short running time so I claim the Euclidean algorithm, and the same thing here for the Dedekind sum, runs in time log of the larger of the two parameters. And by log, I mean any logarithm. So what this suggests is that the Dedekind sum, which initially is a complicated expression, again, think of B as a large number, then we have a large sum over here that takes b steps to compute. By using the reciprocity law, we're reducing the number of steps to a logarithmic expression in b. I should remark here that this is special in the sense that for this argument to work, we need a reciprocity law with just two terms. So it's important for my complexity argument over here that I only have two terms. If you think about applying the same kind of complexity argument to the Zagier reciprocity theorem that we proved earlier, for general D, the situation is much more complicated. At any rate, I hope I convinced you that there's some beauty in this theorem for the classical Dedekind sums. And this beauty is revealed through our study of the partition function using the discrete geometry behind it. And in the next video, we will see another example of the same philosophy applied.